At the beginning of the story, two young men are seen buying food and betting dice on a bowl. But they were suddenly approached by five men, including Siam, Hua, Kuo, Feng, and Feng's subordinate, Akai. The five men came to collect a debt from their boss. When asked what time he would pay the debt, the young man was silent. Kuo, who was emotional, he immediately said dirty words because the young man was just silent, without giving an answer. Then they decided to go home and collect again next month. When going home, Ku tapped the young man on the shoulder and said, next month don't forget to petty. But the young man immediately brushed Ku's hand off his shoulder. Kuo, whose emotions had just subsided, kicked the young man. But suddenly, they were chased by the gangsters of the young man until they were involved in a fistfight in a street alley. One of their enemies who carried a knife trying to injure Xinang, and Hua, who tried to protect Xiang, was slashed on his left arm. Feng helped by stabbing his enemy. And after that, the police arrived. Kuo warned his friends to run away, but Feng's leg was still held by his enemy. Xinang, intending to break his enemy's hold, took a knife and stabbed his enemy with it. The police arrived at the scene, and Xian was arrested. A few years later, the scene shifted to Feng and his gangsters from the Dingzuang group led by Boss Young. They are attending a death ceremony. Boss Young shakes hands with a handsome young man named Michael. He was the son of the deceased gangster leader. While in the funeral room, Michael was approached by his father's right hand. He said that after all this, all the business would be taken care of by him and told Michael to return to America. But Michael had his own thoughts. He wanted to continue his father's business without any interference from anyone else. Three years passed and Si Young was finally released from prison. In front of the prison exit, he was awaited by Hua who would pick him up and take him home. Arriving home, Xiang met his grandmother. They hugged letting go of their longing. Xiang apologized for his mistakes and mischief in the past. Xiang's grandmother also prayed that Xiang wouldn't be naughty and not repeat his actions, tomorrow, and so on. Xiang lives in the house with his grandmother, because his mother has long passed away. At the headquarters, they celebrated Xiang's return, after he got out of prison. During the celebration, in the middle of the event, Xiang's boss announced that all the business would be given to Xiang, due to his loyalty to the group. The decision was also due to Xiang not turning in bring his friends to the police during an accidental murder that happened a few years ago. The scene then moves to Michael, who is trying to bribe someone to get his business to expand quickly in the area. Michael wants his business to expand, but the man tells him that money alone is not enough. Every gang has their own rules, and they are very strict about them. Moreover, Michael was the new guy taking over his father's business. Michael says that in America there are no rules and money is everything. But the man just smiles and explains that money is important, but this is not America. Later in the market, a man is seen looking at a widow's ass and intends to flirt with her. But instead, he gets a slap from the woman and then she leaves. This man was called Uncle Gambler. He then asked Xiang to return the flowers to the widow. But Xiang instead met Memi, the daughter of Uncle Gambler. After a while, there was a sudden raid of street vendors from the municipal police. Xiang helps the old lady push her cart, as she is in charge after owning a business in the market. Afterward, as they want to enter an alley, the cart they were pushing was intercepted by a gang. They said that if they wanted to pass through the place, Xiang would have to pay. Xiang replied that the place belonged to Ding Zhuang. But one of the group said that he didn't care about Ding Zhuang, because the place now belonged to them. Xiang, who couldn't bear to see the grandmother, finally relented and paid the group. While eating dinner, the territory controlled by the Ding Zhuang group is attacked and destroyed by another gang. Akai receives a call with a report that their territory was attacked, and they immediately rushed to go to the battlefield. Xiang wanted to participate, but his friends held him back because he was still on trial and parole, and finally, the fight was inevitable. In a fierce battle, Feng's group and his friends ended up losing in terms of numbers and mass. They decided to retreat and flee. The next day, Feng and his gangster friends returned to avenge last night's attack with more people. But because he was still on parole, Xiang chose not to participate and guarded the market.
Eventually, the two groups meet in an alley to prove who is stronger and who will rule the territory. Then at the market, some people came and asked for security money, and some of them even took merchandise from Uncle Gambler. From afar, Xian couldn't stand the behavior of these people. One of them announced that the people in the market had to pay security money. Xian told the man, there is no security deposit for you. I'm Xian from Dingzhuang. If you have any problems, let's meet somewhere else. After Xian said those words, the man left and the people in the market looked happy. They applauded as an expression of relief for Xian's brave actions. Feng and his friends also could defeat and drive back the gangsters who were rioting. At home, Xian is asked by his grandmother about the wound on his arm. Xian replied that it was not a serious problem. His grandmother then warned Xian to stop being a gangster and find a better job. A difficult choice for Xian. Then the scene moved to them talking business. Boss Young spoke to Michael, you think I don't know what you're planning. Michael explained his business plan in an impolite manner. Because of his disrespectful words towards Boss Young, Feng got angry and kicked the table. They argued and almost got into a fistfight. Fortunately, that uncle who was about to be bribed by Michael mediated the situation, and the atmosphere became more conducive. Eventually, Michael and his gang left, and the business offered by Michael was not approved by Boss Young. Then the scene moved again. It shows Xian's grandmother secretly coming to the Dingzhuang headquarters with food. She talks to Boss Young's wife, expressing her wish for Xian to stop being a gangster and become a good son and filial piety. Next, we see the Uncle Gambler going on a date with a widow he met at the market. This Uncle Gambler is someone who likes to gamble. He would sell anything and go into debt just to gamble. The next day, Uncle Gambler came to see his daughter, Memi, at her workplace. Uncle Gambler asked Memi for money, because his money had run out for gambling. Uncle Gambler asked for money on the grounds that it was for trading capital in the market. Not long after, Feng arrived with some food. Feng asked Uncle Gambler what was wrong. Uncle Gambler then told him, and Feng then gave him money for free. But it seemed that Feng already knew what the money was for. At Boss Young's headquarters, the bosses of the other gangsters were having a meeting to discuss business. Suddenly, the glass is broken by two men on a motorcycle. Kuo ran out, trying to retaliate. But the men had already left. It was suspected that they were Michael's men. The boss who lead the meeting told Feng and his friends to retaliate for the attack. But Xiang was not allowed to go by Boss Young. He was told to stay at the headquarters and accompany him. To make a long story short, Feng and his friends arrived at a parking lot, waiting for Michael, who was choosing a beautiful lady escort, to satisfy his desire. After satisfying his desire, Michael walked to the parking lot, and he already felt bad. Kuo, who was hiding, tried to grab Michael from behind, but failed. Then Akai, Hua, and Feng were ready to attack, but Michael pointed a gun at Feng first. They then stayed, no move. Then Xiang suddenly appears from behind and points a mashi at Michael's neck. Michael, who want to shoot Feng, thought twice and then gave up. Kuo asks for Michael's gun. Feng takes it and points it back at Michael. Feng shoots Michael's men in the leg, and he tells Michael, it's your turn next. At the headquarters, Boss Young tells his wife that he will retire and leave all the business to Xiang. Akai, as Feng's subordinate, heard about Boss Young's plan and reported it to Feng. Feng is visibly jealous. While on the road, Feng is intercepted by someone. It was Michael and his men. Michael doesn't want revenge this time. He wants to get Feng to cooperate and betray his group. With all the seduction, Michael promised Feng a lot of power and profit, but Feng refused and then left. When he returned, Feng saw his subordinate, Akai, being beaten by Boss Young. Akai was punished for secretly using drugs. Feng couldn't help and could only stunning looking what Akai got. Outside, Hua and Kuo were walking and joking around. Arriving in front of the shop, Ku bought cigarettes inside, while Hua waited outside. Then suddenly Hua was kidnapped from behind and put into a car. Hua screamed for help to Kuo, but Kuo was too late. Kuo immediately called headquarters and asked for help. Hua was taken somewhere and put into a burlap sack. Michael, who was sitting in the car, 
looked at the beaten Hua while imagining Xi'an. Maybe Michael has a grudge against Xi'an because of the incident in the parking lot. After being tortured, Hua was returned to his base while still in a burlap sack, and his body was full of wounds. Xi'an comes to the hospital to see him and tells Kuo to take turns standing guard. Kuo gave the gun to Xi'an and said, Take it, the situation is uncertain these days. Then the scene shifted and Uncle Gambler was seen gambling at the venue. Uncle Gambler lost. While on the road, Uncle Gambler was approached by a car and told to get in. It turns out that the Michael's car and Uncle Gambler has a debt to Michael. Uncle Gambler was charged to pay off his debt. And if not, Uncle Gambler's daughter, Memi, would be used as a substitute and forced to work in a prostitution place. Of course, Uncle Gambler refused as Memi was his only daughter. Michael then gave Uncle Gambler a bag of money on the condition that he shoot Feng dead. On the way, Feng received a call from Uncle Gambler who wanted to meet Feng. Feng told the driver to stop at the next intersection. Then it appeared that Feng was already at the promised meeting place with Uncle Gambler but Uncle Gambler was nowhere to be seen. Feeling strange, Feng called Xi'an and told Xi'an to stay alert. Then Feng met Uncle Gambler, who asked what was wrong. Uncle Gambler looked nervous. Feng also asked, how much money do you need? But Uncle Gambler replied that he didn't need money, he just wanted to talk to Feng. Feeling that this meeting was not important, Feng then left. But after Feng turned around, he heard something fall. It was a gun but Uncle Gambler didn't dare to shoot, and his plan failed. When Xiang was joking with his grandmother and stopped at a red light, Xiang's car was suddenly hit from behind. His car was pushed forward, until it was hit by a truck from the side. It was the person who had problems with Xiang at the market got off and approached Xiang. The person intended to shoot Xiang, but Xiang shot him first. Xiang could defeat him, but unfortunately, Xiang's grandmother died on the spot. Seen at the headquarters, Boss Young was reading the newspaper. Suddenly from behind, someone put a gun to his head. It was a Kai. It's unclear what's going through a Kai's mind, why he would kill Boss Young and betray his group. Kuo, who had just parking the car, saw a Kai running with a scared and suspicious face. Then when Feng returned to the headquarters, he had already seen his boss lifeless, lying on the floor. The next day, Feng and Kuo are in a field, they pray and vow to take revenge. They buy weapons for the plan. While in the car, Kuo asks about Xiang's news, and Feng replies, not knowing. As they are about to depart from a pier, Xiang suddenly follows behind in a boat. There was a celebration at the edge of the pier. But behind the celebration was Michael. It turned out that he was recruiting fishermen to do business with. One of the people asked Michael to give a speech, because he was the president of the Fishermen's Association. When Michael was giving a speech, suddenly behind the crowd, Xiang immediately shot at the people who were around Michael. And there was a shootout. Xiang was shot in the stomach, while Michael escaped and was chased by Feng. The wounded Xiang also joined the chase. Kuo himself was seen holding Michael's men. But Kuo was finally knocked out. They continued to chase each other until they came to a stream, where Feng pushed Michael, and they both fell into the water. They got into a fight. Xiang helped Feng from behind and choked Michael. Michael slammed Xiang down, picked up a brick, and smashed Xiang's head repeatedly. From behind, Feng stabs Michael in the back with a piece of wood. Michael pushes Feng away and picks up the wood that was stuck in his back, then stabs Feng again. Xiang picked up Michael's gun, which had fallen in the water, and fired it at Michael, who died on the spot. After that, they sat down and leaned against the wall. It can be seen that Xiang is still taking out cigarettes and sharing them with Feng. When Feng wanted to share the fire, Xiang was silent. And it turns out that Xiang is already death. And finally, the movie ended with a silent and sad atmosphere. In this Gato 2 movie, it still revolves around gangster life but with different characters and settings. The story will begin with a group of gangsters known as the Northern Fortress, led by a man named Ren. At the beginning of the story, a group of people are seen holding a bald-headed man as hostage. They are Ren's men, the leader of the Northern Fortress gangster group. Soon after, 
Ren arrives loudly and shoots at the legs of the bald-headed man, who is Chen, as a warning to him. But just as Ren want to execute Chen, the phone suddenly rang. The message from the phone told Ren not to hurt Chen, because Chen's father was a friend of the person who called. While talking on the phone, Chen said something that made Ren angry and almost killed Chen on the spot. Later at the North Fortress headquarters, Ren was scolded by someone named Guy. It turns out that Guy is a senior figure in the Northern Fortress gang group, and all actions and plans must be approved by him. Gui forbade Ren and his men to take actions that could trigger a war. He reminded them that decisions must always be in accordance with the approval of Guy. While playing dominoes, Big C suddenly appeared and said, I've heard what happened in the Northern City, and the chairman is not happy about it. Ren quickly solved the problem by giving money to Big C, and the matter was resolved. Soon after, Ren receives a call from his old friend Liu Jian. When they meet, Jian reveals his plans to run a business and meet with important people in the northern city. Tension arises, however, when Jian suddenly points a gun at Ren and fires it into the air. Suddenly, the people around are terrified. Ren is confused by the intentions of Jian's actions. Until finally Jian reveals his intention, he will compete with Ren to control the northern city. Ren gave Jian a domino number 7 as a sign of good luck. When the police arrested Jian, he said to Ren, After I have all the business in Taipei, I will come back here. Wait for me. Hearing that, Ren realized that the rivalry between them was not over, and the future of Northern City was still on the verge of uncertainty. Three years later, the situation in North City has changed. Big Chao, Ren's men, and the frontmen of the North Fortress gangsters came to collect security money from a shop house. Suddenly, a Lamborghini car appeared. It was driven by two men, the Blonde or Seiko and the Pigtail or Biao. The Blonde gave money to Big Chao and threatened that if anything happened to his car, his legs would be broken. Big Chao was taken aback by the threat and asked the waiter. The waiter explained that they were business people from the pharmaceutical sector who were very rich. But Big Chao's confusion didn't last long because suddenly several people appeared with guns, pointed them at him, and forced Big Chao to leave. The situation is getting more intense in the northern city with the emergence of a new force that threatens the stability has been built so far. They find Chen, whose right leg was shot off by Ren earlier in the movie. They offer to work together, but Chen refuses, as their business is a pharmaceutical business for useless addicts. Without hesitation, the pigtails immediately beat Chen's hand, damaging his fingers. After that, they take Chen to the top of the building, which turns out to be Jan's men. For the second time, Jan offered business to Chen and gave him money, but Chen still refused. Then Jian calls Ren and, in a firm tone, says that he has taken over the business that Ren failed to get three years ago. Jian then turned his thumbs down as a signal, and Chen was immediately thrown from the top of the building. Chen's henchman, who we'll just call Mushroom Hair, was given a bag of money, and thus all problems and cases were immediately resolved completely. Ren and the Northern Fortress gang came to Chen's death ceremony, which was attended by Jian as well. Jan just smiles sarcastically knowing what happened. When Ren and Jian met outside, they acted casually, even greeting and hugging each other, as if nothing had happened in front of their men. Then the atmosphere shifts when Jian takes Ren to the container warehouse. Jan shows some of his business, and tries to get Ren to cooperate, but Ren refuses his offer. Ren firmly said that although he wouldn't refuse a fight, it was not his field and beyond his ability. Jan's face looked disappointed. Then he said, let's talk about it again later while enjoying stewed meat over rice. Despite the tension between them, they kept their decorum and invited each other to talk further in a more relaxed atmosphere. While everyone was gathered at the family event, Big Chao was secretly trying to do business with Jan, unbeknownst to Ren and his friends. Jan asked Big Chao, do you think the drug business is dirty? Big Chao replied firmly, it was just a business. Jan added, Ren didn't know you were here, did he? Didn't he forbid you from dealing drugs? Suddenly, the blonde hit Big Chao on the head from behind, knocking him down. Then Big Chao looked battered, sitting on a chair with a lit cigarette. 
Ren and his men came to pick up Big Chow, who was already in a mess. Jan tried to ease the tension by inviting Ren to sing, remembering the song they sang as children. However, Big King and Panda seemed unable to hold back their emotions seeing Big Chow from a distance who was helpless and really mess. Afterwards, Jan explains to Ren that Big Chow tried to have a relationship behind his back, and because of that Jan has punished him. Ren then apologizes to Jan, taking this as his mistake. Jian then one last time offers business to Ren, as he wants to expand sales in the northern city. But Ren still refused it and said to Jian, If I refuse it, will you make me suffer the same fate as Chen? Jian just smiled. Then he took out a domino number seven and returned it to Ren as a sign of good luck. As Jian stood up to leave, the fight suddenly broke out. Help came from Po and friends. Meanwhile, Big King told Ren to leave the place. The blonde tries to fire his gun at Ren, but Big Chow, who felt guilty, blocked the shot, which killed him. At Ren's headquarters, he and his men have been preparing to take revenge for Big Chiu's death. But before starting the plan, Ren must get permission from their boss, Guy. But it's clear that Guy will never allow the plan, due to its dangerous consequences. Hearing about the revenge for Big Chiu's death, Big King, Po, and Panda plan to avenge it without their boss know. They began spying on the blonde's activities from inside the car to find out his habits and where he usually go. Day after day passed without success, but finally Po, who was on watch, spotted the blonde coming into a nightclub. He immediately alerted his friends as their target had finally appeared. Inside the club, the blonde was seen having fun with a lady companion under the drug's effect. After enjoying the body of the lady companion, the blonde exited the club with a woman, still under the drug's effect. Without waiting long, Po and his friends, who were already outside, immediately attacked. The blonde, realizing he was under attack, immediately grabbed a gun from a car. From behind, Panda immediately attacked and kicked the blonde until he fell. But not satisfied with that, Panda, still full of emotion, continued to attack the blonde repeatedly. Until finally he was completely killed. Meanwhile, the woman who was with the blonde was still under the drug's effect, just laughing at the terrible events that happened in front of her. <laughs> While they were eating, Ren suddenly came and got angry at Big King. But since Ren was already hungry, he ended up ordering food and tried to forget what had happened. After the blonde's death, the conflict between the two groups became even more chaotic, and wars between groups broke out everywhere. Mushroom Hair, who was previously Chen's men, now became Jian's men, and he created chaos in the Northern Fortress territory. Eventually, the two groups counterattacked each other. A grand war ensued on the street, where Panda, who wanted to join the fight, wasn't allowed by his friends. They realized that if Panda joined in, the enemy group would find out that he killed the blonde, and that could make Panda a target for attack. In the end, they were all arrested by the police. The chief even got tired of arresting them. In the midst of the riot, Panda was apparently kidnapped and severely tortured. He was tied up and beaten. And the woman who had been with the blonde sprayed oil on him and burned him alive. The next day, Panda's body was returned to the base in a very bad condition. His body was even casted in cement in a barrel. At the headquarters, the chief of police pleaded with Ren not to avenge Panda's death, in order to prevent the conflict between the two groups from getting worse. Ren considered the request, but the conflict that had already occurred made his decision difficult. The Northern Fortress then decided to avenge the death of its members. At a temple, they gathered to pray and chose one representative to carry out the task of revenge. One by one, they took a stick to determine who would represent them. It was Po who was chosen as the executor. Bing King, unsure of Po's abilities, asks Ren to let him do the job himself. But Ren insists that rules are rules, and Po must carry out his duties as the executor. Despite his doubts, Big King had to accept the decision. While carrying out the action, Po was accompanied by Pretty Pan. Pan tried to contact Big King in case something bad happened, but Po forbade him. Po was confident that he could complete the task on his own and this was a chance for Poe to prove himself to the group. 
As Pan waited in suspense, the restaurant door suddenly closed and the lights went out. Pan was confused and didn't know what to do, so he got out of the car and tried to catch up with Po. But suddenly Jian appeared across the street with his men. Luckily, Pan could escape safely. But because his plan failed and Jian had recognized Pan's face, Pan was no choice to leave the city immediately, so as not to end up dead. The next morning, Pan was escorted by Big King to the ship dock. Pan asked Big King how long it would take to return and Big King replied, about 20 years, a very long time. Before leaving, Pan gave Big King a message to take care of his fiancée and child. Upon returning, Big King received a call from Po, who was hiding in an apartment. When King arrived, he was immediately angry with Po. Po tried to explain to King that he was scared and didn't know what to do. But King asked why Po didn't call him. He then expressed his disappointment to Po for his treatment of Pan. King said that now Pan, who was the youngest member among them, had to leave forever from there. King criticized the way Po treated his brother in such a dishonorable manner, until finally this matter was heard by Boss Gui. At the headquarters, Boss Guy asked Ren if he had taken care of Pan. Ren replied that he had told people to take care of him. Since the problem was getting bigger, Boss Gui felt the need to call a meeting so that the problem could be solved properly and there would be no more victims. Finally, the big meeting arrived and held, attended by many gangster representatives from various cities, including the chief of police who was also present. Boskele asked all the members present for advice on the situation. Jan suddenly stood up and stepped into the center of the room. But what he delivered was not the expected advice, but rude and disrespectful words to Boskele. The atmosphere in the room was getting intense, and it almost sparked a showdown between the two groups. After the meeting, Ren offered to take Bosque home, but Bosque chose King to drive him. On the way home in the car, Bosque tells King about the beginning of the formation of the Gatao. The Gatao used to be a group of young men who were full of passion and a sense of justice. Their mission was to protect the local community, and they treated all members like family. Over time, many members joined and the Gatao became a force to be reckoned with. You can't always solve problems with violence, was Bosque's message to King. Bosque also advised King not to provoke Ren to fight. But in a high tone, King tried to explain what had happened to his brothers, so that it made Bosque's heart disease come up. Bosque told King to get his medicine from the table. As King wanted to get some water, he saw a picture of Ren with Boss Guai. All this time, Ren's decisions and plans always didn't get permission from Boss Guni, making King think twice. He deliberately didn't give the medicine to Boss Guni and let his illness relapse. Then, Boss Guai died. Ren, who found out about it, became very angry with King because he felt that King couldn't take good care of his boss. After the funeral, King offered to take Ren home, but because he was still upset with King, Ren ignored him. After the incident, King brooded by the harbor while enjoying a cigarette. When he returned home, King found a letter tucked beside his house. The letter was from Pretty Pan. The content told about the state of Pretty Pan, who was trying to start his new life in a new place. Despite trying to join a new group, he wasn't as happy as he had been when he was part of the Northern Fortress. Pretty Pan missed the atmosphere of hanging out with his friends, his brothers there. He kept thinking about it, which made him depressed and decided to end his life by jumping off the top of the building. This news left Chain even more devastated. He vented his anger by the harbor, contemplating the loss of Pretty Pan and deep sorrow. While at the headquarters, Ren made a decision in earnest. He called Jian and said, This is the last time I call you brother, let's meet but only between you and me. Then Ren called one of his men to contact Big King. Ren's wife, who knew what her husband was going to do, cried while cooking. Ren told his wife he would be back soon. As Ren left, her crying intensified. Upon arriving at the headquarters, King asked what was going on and where the boss was. But none of them knew, because Ren went alone to Jan's headquarters. When they met Jian, they sat down to talk about it while enjoying their favorite dish, boiled pork over rice. The meal was a memory from the time when they were still best friends. 
Here Jane confided in Ren, the owner of the food stall we used to frequent had a beautiful daughter. Back then, I had nothing to impress her with. Now I'm rich, but she's married to someone else. Ren then asks Jain if during the meeting three years ago, Jan anticipated this kind of situation. Jan then told Ren that he was jealous of him, because without spending any penny, Ren has people who are loyal and support him, which is different from Jan himself. Jan had spent a lot of money, but still felt like he didn't have anyone he could truly trust and be loyal to. He is then seen crying and says, not that he didn't anticipate, he just couldn't believe their friendship would end like this. Just as Ren want to shoot Jan, someone suddenly puts a gun to Ren's head. Of course, this wasn't the original agreement between the two of them. As a boss, of course Jan is embarrassed by the actions of his men who are outside the agreement with Ren. When he want to hit, the pigtail told Jan that there was no time. Jian was silent and let his men's plan go. Suddenly, Big King and Po came from behind and shot the person who put the gun to Ren's head. Then King arrived and immediately finished them all off, until finally the police came and arrested them all. One day, Ren visits Big King in prison. He asked about Po, and King replied that Po was placed in a special cell because he fought with other prisoners. Then King asked about Jian. Ren replied that after that incident, he never heard from Jan again, which turned out to be, that time, Jan was shot dead by his own men. The movie ends by seeing how Jan and Ren used to meet and become best friends. And then, the movie ended.